Heli Kasser Jane, and welcome to the Heli Kasser Jane Show, a smart, witty, and timely podcast brought to you at a time when Americans are getting fed up with all the shouting and bickering in Washington, D.C. So I, Heli Kasser Jane, and veteran White House correspondent Matthew Cooper are here to offer you an insightful, engaging journey into the world of politics always with a smile and dialogue that snap crackles and pops. And with our very special guests, we strive to offer a different take on all things politics in our weekly conversations. So pour yourselves a martini, grab a spot on your favorite sofa, and have a listen as we tackle it all and like to stir and yes, sometimes shake things up. On this episode of the Hallie Caster Jane Show, The Trial of the Century? In his new book, Theodore Roosevelt for the Defense, The Courtroom Battle to Save His Legacy, ABC News anchor Dan Abrams talks Teddy Roosevelt, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. And what was then the trial of the century? No, not the O.J. Simpson trial that made Abrams a household name. And that's where we begin this week, when Abrams joins me in conversation. But that's not all. Stay tuned for the second half of the show, when my partner in politics, veteran White House correspondent Matthew Cooper, and I slice and dice all things politics on the Hallie Kasser Jane Show with Matthew Cooper. We're just beginning. Here we go. It is clear Dan Abrams never sleeps. The chief legal affairs correspondent for ABC News, as well as the host of top-rated Live PD on A&E Network, and the Dan Abrams Show, where politics meets the law, on Sirius XM, in his spare time, writes books. On the heels of the New York Times bestselling Lincoln's Last Trial, the murder case that propelled him, co-authored with his writing partner David Fisher, the two have a new book. Let's talk with Dan Abrams about his book, Theodore Roosevelt for the Defense, The Courtroom Battle to Save His Legacy. Hi, Allie. Hi, Dan. How are you? Great. Good. Listen, you know what I said in my intro? I know you couldn't hear it because we had you uh, queued out, but I began with uh, it's clear that Dan Abrams never sleeps. You can't possibly. Do you ever sleep? Do you ever? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I do. I sleep. I actually am a big advocate of the need. Uh, it's a health matter for sleep, but uh, but I'm doing a lot of different things. Uh, you so surely make sure that I sneak it in. You surely, surely I are. And, you know, I was thinking about when I was putting the interview together. I said, "Does this guy's mind ever stop? Does it?" Um, no. I mean, I'm always. You know, look. I I think I think one of the reasons that I was not satisfied as a as a TV news full time TV news anchor was that there were too many other things I wanted to do. And you can't do all those things when you're a full-time employee of a company. Mm -hmm. And now, if I think of something that I think is a really cool or interesting idea, I can just do it. And I don't think there's anything more empowering than that. I think anyone who owns a small business, a medium-sized business, even a large business, knows, um, yes, there are there's a price to pay. Uh, for having, you know, being on your own as opposed to reporting to others. But the uh, the value of that and the, the feeling of the sense of accomplishment it, uh, vastly outweighs it. I bring it up because of, obviously, nobody in this country sleeps anymore, but I also bring it up because uh, I think there's something you have in common with Theodore Roosevelt, the subject of this terrific new book, Theodore Roosevelt for the Defense, um, I, and But before we go into what I think you guys have in common, I want to ask you this. There are a thousand stories in the Naked City. How, how come you, you went with this one? Why did you guys uh, make that your focus, this particular story? So, Dave, yeah, David Fisher and I, my co-author, um, were looking for – so coming off of, of Lincoln's last trial, which was a, a transcript, the only transcript that exists of any case that Lincoln had ever argued from nine months before he got the Republican nomination with Lincoln as a lawyer – we said, my goodness, is there another transcript out there? Are there others that have been sort of forgotten to history that are these great legal stories? And lo and behold, we found this trial that was a six-week trial with Theodore Roosevelt as the defendant, where he lived in Syracuse, New York, 
before the trial, testified for eight days, cared enormously about the outcome in this case, and thought, well, you know, that's a perfect one uh, as our as our follow up, and in particular because also you know Roosevelt often looked back to Lincoln for answers on mo- his most difficult questions. He read um, many books on Lincoln and often asked himself, what would Lincoln do? So it made the connection between these two stories real. There are some trials, uh, before we get into it, I, I really do want you to give us a brief synopsis because I, I see a correlation here between this story and contemporary America, and I think you do too, obviously. So let's get a brief synopsis so the listener has some clue who this William Barnes was, you know, why the former president, you know, gets uh, into this trial. Yeah. Talk to me. So, so William Barnes was a Republican Party leader, and Roosevelt called him corrupt, and he sued him. <laughs> um, there was a history between the two, um, and Roosevelt had felt that Barnes was largely responsible for making sure Roosevelt did not get the Republican nomination in 1912. So Roosevelt had been president until 1909 and decided not to run again. And then when he saw what he viewed as William Howard Taft not living up to his legacy, he decided to run again in 1912. And and he felt that the people weren't having enough input, the citizens, the voters, in the process. And it was the party bosses who were deciding that Roosevelt would not be the candidate, and that instead it would be Taft. And then, of course, Roosevelt got more votes than the Republican uh, Taft, even though they split the vote and Wilson won. <laughs> um, but that history is very relevant, in taking us to where we are when the trial starts in 1915, where the reason Roosevelt was calling Barnes corrupt was because he was saying that Barnes and the head of the Democratic Party actually were together trying to ensure that the party bosses stayed in power. And this trial was over that statement. Pretty interesting, right? And pretty comparable to today, if you think about it. How crazy is that? It was the, considered the trial of the century at the time, yes? Absolutely. Um, it was, at the time, the front pages of every paper in America. And the New York Times devoted six to 12 pages per day to what was happening in this case. Um, and I think that's, that's sort of amazing when you think back on it, that, that it was this front page story everywhere that somehow became forgotten a hundred years later. So look, as we talk about in the introduction, there have been probably 20 trials of the century in the 20th century. Um, but at the time, this was undeniably one of them. So why was it lost to history? I think historians don't view the trial as that important, even though it was incredibly important to Roosevelt. And I think, you know, you see, for example, Edmund Morris, who's the great Roosevelt biographer, um, who in his third book on Roosevelt, and he broke it up into different points in Roosevelt's life, in Colonel Roosevelt, he has one chapter on this, and that's really the only the only person who's really written about this in any uh, significant way, but he has one chapter on this trial and he kind of poo poos it and he kind of sort of feels sorry for Roosevelt that this is, um, you know, it's almost pathetic uh, the way Roosevelt is being um, forced into this situation. And yet that's not the way we viewed it. Meaning that, you know, I think we became, you know, Morris is a much, much greater expert on Theodore Roosevelt than either David Fisher or I are. But when it comes to this trial, uh, we are, be- we are greater experts mm-hmm. because we spent so much time focusing on this trial. And, and, and I think that the, is part of the reason that historians have not focused on it is it wasn't, you know, it didn't lead to the Panama Canal. It wasn't related to World War I. It didn't, um, you know, it didn't affect his Nobel Prize, um, but it did come at a time for Roosevelt when his legacy was critical. And, and as a result, he, you know, he, there were times when he wouldn't go home for the weekend uh, because he was concerned there'd been a big legal ruling against him. This was the former president of the United States. 
And he would stay in Syracuse, New York, because he wanted to make sure that he could, as best as possible, prepare with his lawyers for the next week. It shows you he recognized how much was at stake here for him. And, and I think that that's what, I think that's the mistake historians have made is that we get to see the words of Theodore Roosevelt, not in the speech, not in his writings, but under cross examination. And you really get to get a good feeling of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the person as you're reading through this, uh, the, the book. Okay. So let me just bring this one in. So the trial of the century, you, OJ, you know, made your mark in those back in the day. Is that going to be forgotten? No, it won't be forgotten. Uh, it'll never be forgotten. Um, it certainly will become, you know, uh, a less momentous event. I mean, I think that there are some, you know, amazing trials from history that we now, you have to read books to know about. The fact that we have the, the O.J. Simpson case on tape, on video, will make that different. I think we'll always make it something that will not be forgotten. Um, but, you know, look, as I was there every day in the O.J. Simpson case, I remember thinking, oh, my, there could never have been a trial this big. There could never be anything where everyone was watching it this closely. Mm-hmm. And again, I think when you look back to history, you realize, you know, yeah, there was these TV was new and cable news was new. And yes, there were other reasons to make it feel even bigger and amplified. But the truth was that there had been other cases where the world was watching. And certainly the country was watching. One last point, my friend. One last point. Roosevelt was the master of the media. I don't think people knew about that in our generation. So we have this media-savvy president in Trump today. Roosevelt opened the press room in the White House. Trump seems to have closed it. Here's the question. If Trump were to read Theodore Roosevelt for the defense, what do you think would be the best lesson for him to learn from Roosevelt's courtroom battle to save his legacy? Should Trump face an impeachment trial or other? What what, what would be the best uh, he could learn? Well, look, I think that, that I think it would be great to see how seriously Roosevelt took his honesty and his integrity and that that mattered to him enormously. Look, there are definitely I think if Donald Trump is to read this book, he'll see real similarities in certain ways between himself and Roosevelt. And the important thing would be for him to also recognize that there are differences and to ask himself, you know, are these differences areas where I really want to be? that different uh, from Roosevelt. And so so when Roosevelt was accused of being just as corrupt as the person he had accused of corruption, he took great umbrage to it and and was able to demonstrate that he was different um, and that, that really the basic issues of honesty in politics, integrity, mattered to him. And, you know, I think that that's something uh, where... Uh, Donald Trump could certainly uh, use uh, a, a little bit of Roosevelt in him, uh, and uh, despite the fact that there are these ways that the two men are, are similar. Rumors are Trump doesn't read, but if I were you, I'd send him the book. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Great book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have Thank a great so one. Much. All right. Bye-bye. I've been speaking with Dan Abrams. His book is Theodore Roosevelt for the Defense, The Courtroom Battle to Save His Legacy. Available at fine bookstores everywhere and on Amazon.com. It's Matt and Hallie time. Here we go. Good afternoon, Matt. It's nice to have you here. I'm feeling so badly for you because I know... Last week I got hit on the head, and this week you. I know cold. we're the walking wounded, <laughs> you and I. What the hell is I, going I have a slight on? cold or something. You, but, but it, awful. Uh, you poor thing with the head injuries. And I think <laughs> we need Secret Service protection. Or I something. think I absolutely do. And and oh God, what a week this has been. I'm, oh well, I'm getting into the personal stuff too much. But I had a I had an encounter with a hawk, a red shoulder hawk today, who has been living on my property and just a great... And you don't mean John Bolton. You mean a real hawk. <laughs> I mean the real thing. Wait, maybe there's a message in all of that for me. <laughs> anyway, I found it wounded in the swale and broken its uh, wing, I think. Uh, and I called oh um, uh, Animal Control and they were so wonderful and they came out. But for <laughs> half an hour, I had to sit with the little creature who was terrified of me in the beginning. And towards the end, I, I put a picture up on Facebook if anybody wants to see it because it was really a moment. The good news is 
they're going to take it to um, to be fixed, uh, and they will bring it back to the property and re-release him here. So well, that's good. That's good. So I just I was so moved by that today. I just wanted to share that with everybody because you know. There is a human side to both Matt and Hallie. <laughs> we don't know. Ooh, yes. There's more yes, we're not, we're not the Uber mensch. No, I, we I, we're, no, we're more than politics. So there we go. So from, from the eagle has landed <laughs> to, <laughs> to Mr. Joe Biden. I want to begin, Matt, with something you said on the show two weeks ago. You said two weeks ago it'll be about two weeks and the press is going to be all over Biden. Here we go. Well, honey, it was two weeks, and there they were. Boy, they beat the crap out of him this week until today. Talk to me. Right. Well, uh, you know, former Vice President Biden uh, did a double backflip on um, federal funding for abortion. Uh, He uh, reversed his longstanding support of the Hyde Amendment, the 1970s uh, era law that prohibited any federal funds to go for abortions. And, uh, you know, a lot of Democrats had supported that over the years. It was sort of just kind of a fact of life in Washington. Uh, And even today, very unlikely to be overturned no matter who wins the presidential race next year. But Nevertheless, uh, feeling a lot of pressure from um, uh, abortion rights advocates in the Democratic Party, uh, Biden did a backflip that wasn't the most artful. Uh, just a couple of days earlier, he had seemed to reiterate support for the uh, amendment. And then he said, well, you know, it's a different world now and Roe v. Wade's in danger and I can't uh, I can't support that that ban anymore. So he's taken uh, a lot of grief, uh, both for kind of flip flopping uh, and for seeming to lose one of his, uh, you know, better assets, which is seeming integrity. Um, so, you know, it was uh, it, it was a tricky situation for Biden, but he's made his decision, and um, and that's where he stands. I disagree because I know, I thought that they were really hard on him, and I don't think it was entirely fair. Now they did not handle it artfully. That I will agree with you on. They just yeah. didn't. I mean, it was absurd what happened. Okay, fine. But the case that he made, somebody not quite as adept as he might not have made the same case that he made. I don't think it was a flip-flop, and I think that's a, that's where I have the argument. I think it was an evolution that maybe should have come a long time ago. He is a Catholic, so right there the whole abortion thing is pretty weird for him, you can be sure, right, uh, on that generation. But Roe is under assault, and that just does change the equation. But he also said something else. He also said it also is unfair to the poor and disadvantaged the Hyde Amendment, and he is correct on that. It always has been. Right. But, you know, when Roe is, when you can't have an abortion in Missouri, and you have to have, uh, um, you know, Chicago land, Illinois, saying, come to us, uh, I, I think it changes the equation. Uh, There's no question it, it raises the 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 cost and obstacles, um, you know, to a lot of women. Um, absolutely. I mean, it might have been one thing to have to pay for it yourself, but you had access to a clinic. Now, right. if you have to go to another state, Which if sure, you don't have I, any money, you I get that. Pay. And look, I, I I was just repeating the, no, the no, rap no, I on know. him. I wasn't I, I, attacking. I th- I th- I think he had to do it politically. I just don't think it's the word. Flip-flop. In today's Democratic Party, you can be for the Hyde Amendment. It's the flip flop word because I don't think it's fair to say it was a flip flop, and mm-hmm. it goes back to John Kerry when it got such a bad name. So, well, I mean, I like flip flopping generally. You know, I, I generally think of flip flopping as, <laughs> as growth. Like, <laughs> like Lincoln was the biggest flip flopper, and, do, and it was a good thing he was. <laughs> Roosevelt was a flip flopper. You know, he was he was considered so um, protean in his positions that uh, they called him a chameleon on plaid. <laughs> Um, <laughs> just let that sink in. Yeah. A chameleon on plaid. So I, 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 I like flip flopping, uh, but this was not. Yeah, I don't think it was terribly well executed. And even worse, his staff kept leaking all these stories about how they like told him he had to yeah. switch. And yeah, yeah. So there's a it made problem. him look. Yeah. Well, that's really bad. You never want the story to be like you know you were at the mercy of your staff and there's you also were getting schooled staff. by them. What what's the the um, black girl who's running his who used to be with Bernie? Yeah, Simone Sanders. Yeah, I have a problem with her. Um, Why? I don't. I because I think that she doesn't always come across uh, elegantly. And here's Biden is elegant, and that's one of the things that is so wonderful about him in the orbit we're in right now versus Trump. And she is not. 
she doesn't reflect him to me. She reflects something else. Now, that might have been a ch- the choice they made to bring her in, but she also did not do him any favors when she came on to defend him on this. I thought she was not elegant at all. So yeah, I, it's an issue. From uh, Yeah, I, I don't know. I, 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 elegant is probably not the word I would use to describe Aiden. But, um, but you know, when, when I say elegant, I mean, compared to like, he, he's not Trump. He's he, 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 Yeah. So you come up with a better word. That's fine. Uh, but you right, got the drink. Right. You got the gist. Yeah, I, 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 I get what you're saying. I mean, she's – well, she was definitely the hero of some of these leaked reports. That, like she's the one who, you know, explains to him the plight of women. And, you know, whether she leaked that or not or whether it happened or not, I don't know. But I don't think that makes Biden look great. No, but that's a different position she's in. And if she's good on – policy great i just don't know that she should be the front person for him because she she just didn't do it such a i've seen her a number of times and i'm i just don't i think she just gets a little mouthy uh but hey you know let's see what happens you know this is all new too right so a lot of us right. can go through uh iterations and we'll see what that what happens so today he, he's in in iowa much of the finally <laughs> <laughs> because some people were upset that he wasn't there Saturday when everybody right. else was, but he was at his granddaughter's uh, graduation. Uh, sure. So, and family right now to him is, you know, sacrosanct. So there he was. How do you think he handled himself today? How do you think that speech went? How do you think that leaking it to the press early in the morning went? Uh, what are your thoughts? You know, I think it's fine. I don't think it was exceptional. I don't think it really, um, you know, put him well ahead of his Democratic competition. You know, I think it was uh, it was Trump directed, but it didn't start to break. You know, it didn't it didn't subtly distinguish him from the pack. Uh, so you know, I thought it was fine, but I don't think it was. I don't think it's one we'll be talking about in two weeks. But there were some things that happened today that I thought were important that we may be talking about. Some two things that he said: he's Trump is an existential threat to the U.S. That was bold. I thought I I, I liked that. I thought it was some time that some time that you know. I mean, he said he's come close, but he hasn't gotten that far. So I thought it was wonderful that he went that far. I think he's correct, by the way. What I noticed, I didn't see the whole thing, but what I did see, you know, what fascinated me was when he was reading, he was not terrific. And then he just, you know, took the mic off the stand and started walking through the group and yakking away. And I thought he was terrific. I thought he was terrific when he handled the heckler and said, come sit with me and we'll talk. I promise afterwards, you know. And then he said, it, this isn't a Trump rally. What do you think of that line? Yeah, that was a good line. <laughs> I thought it was a, that was a good line. Yeah, it really, 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 really yeah. was. Um, yeah, no, he's got he's got skills, but I just um, you know, I just didn't think it was like an exceptional thing. Yeah, but. I don't think it was a speech like it was. You know, it, listen, you know, compare it. Trump gave us a, a, a wonderful speech uh, at D Day with absolutely no humanity behind it whatsoever, and no no belief, no. no. <laughs> No, 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 no. And that voice he had, which I don't think you and I discussed uh, last well, week. Well, there's there's his reading voice. Oh, my God, what is that? <laughs> yeah, there's his reading voice, and then there's his, <laughs> his actual voice. I just don't um, get it. Yeah. I just don't I, get it. So, 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 you know, it's a, it's a, to me, it's a pleasure to see Biden. I'm sorry. And to have somebody who could put a, you know, a noun and a verb and an adjective. Yeah. And, I think the English, uh, the, yeah, the English language skills of the Democrats are generally better than Trump's. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Um, but he, you know, he did say that line again. Trump is an existent, existential threat to the U.S. You know, and I thought to myself, he should have added the current Rep- and the current Republican Party because he actually said he thought the Republicans are redeemed. Right. Well, he keeps saying, yeah, I don't know why he keeps saying that. I mean, all because he's trying to get Republicans to cross over. Yeah. But so he doesn't want to make an enemy. Right. No, I understand that. Yeah, I think that's what that's what his whole trip is about. But, you know, uh, I was talking to a friend who, who said, I don't know if they're redeemable. And I said, uh, you know, what's he doing? I said, well, like, I, look, Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, when she killed the Wicked Witch and the guard came up and she thought he was going to go and kill her. And instead, he started, broke out into song. Ding dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> I mean, Exactly. <laughs> there is that too. Uh, so, so um, the question yeah. about Biden, I wanted to ask you: Do you think he's above the fray? Has he set himself up to be above it all? Is 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 he elevated to some degree? Well, by virtue of his universal name recognition and his, uh, you know, status as front runner and former vice president, he's kind of in a world of his own but you know as we're going to see when this debate happens later this month he's going to be you know he's going to be in the arena taking taking punches and giving them and you know those exalted places of 
you know, being above it all don't last very long. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, he's kind of running a weird campaign on one hand. A lot of people talking about this. I, I, I thought so too. And that he's, he's, he's actually running a general election campaign <laughs> rather than, you know, cause he's competing, you know, against Trump. He's like, you know. Yeah. I think you're, you're right. He's sort of trying out his, you know, this is what I'll be like as the nominees. Look, I can do this. I don't need Geritol. I don't need a hearing aid. I don't need a walker. I can do this. You well, know, I can deliver. And it also says to, you know, the, the, the subtle message is also like, you know, don't screw around, you know, by picking one of these people you like, you might like more. Don't, don't go with the, you know, the gay mayor or the, <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah right in other words i'm the one that can get elected this is not yeah this is yeah. not the uh hick and looper moment you right. know go yeah. with me yeah i know what i'm doing so so a couple of things you mentioned <laughs> i think trump is uh trying the old hillary playbook on biden now let me explain you know, biden's weak he's mentally unfit you know yeah. uh, sleepy sleepy biden all that kind of crap i mean you right know, um the only one i haven't heard is corrupt Biden. Haven't heard that yet. Although, but you know, the party start the Republicans like throw out his stuff about his son and his son sure. in Ukraine, but you know, that's out in the ozone or whatever. I want to say one thing about Biden. He looks a lot better now than he did when he first started the race. Did you notice that? Yeah, I think they're paying a little more attention to his uh, appearance, his, his makeup, his demeanor, his, and he looks like he yeah. gained a little weight. Um, Might have, yeah, yeah. So, um, so he's starting to look like the old Joe. So I think that's really interesting. Uh, either that or the Botox wore off. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> it's like he looks human again. Right. Uh, so I think that's a really, really good thing. You were listening to the Hallie Kessler Jane Show. The Hallie Kessler Jane Show posts new podcasts Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern at HallieKesslerJane.com and is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Be sure to find us on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and at our newest home, Radio Public, and on all your favorite apps. You can find The Hallie Caster Jane Show on your Alexa device, too. Just say, The Hallie Caster Jane Show. Oh, and come play with me on Twitter at The Hallie CJ Show. I had an interaction with Joy Reid, and I did want to bring this up on air. For a very good reason. Interaction on on the Twitter. On the Twitter with Joy Reid. Uh, okay, she, how she was that? She posted something. Uh, I I actually had been watching her show, and I can't remember the name of the uh, woman. Who Saturday was, morning. Yes, uh, did you thing? see it? No, I I, I, I got were, better were things on Saturday work. morning. <laughs> Saturday morning public affairs TV. Come on, we got to get you out more. <laughs> Thanks. I love you too. <laughs> okay, so Saturday morning you catch Joy Reid. <laughs> so I'm watching. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm going to kill you. So I'm much, teasing. I know you are. I love you for this. I'm laughing my head off. Um, so anyway, she goes after Biden, this woman, whoever she was. And then Joy chimes in and tweets, Joe Biden, like Trump, is a nostalgic candidate. He appeals to a boomer and adjacent Trump-exhausted electorate longing to return to a mythical path. In Biden's case, that supposedly was more bipartisan and less wrenching on social and, and racial issues. The challenge is that Bidenism, like Trumpism, longs for a time in America that didn't really exist. Biden also appeals to voters, many black voters, who after Trump's election, frankly, no longer trust in the racial gender progressivism of their neighbors. And then she went on to say that Biden nostalgia is Obama nostalgia. I'll cut it short. I said bad spin by Dem left and insulting. Is Biden's problem that he's a man, a white man, an older man, uh, any or, or either incapable of, of forward thinking? Take your pick. Racism, ageism, gender inequality. D, all of the above. Shameful. And she said, that wasn't my point. I can see you're upset. I'll just leave it to you with that, which I said to her. Look, Joy, if you think I got it wrong, explain it. Nope, she cut and run. Yeah. There was something in there. And I think it's problematic because I see what's happening on the far left. And it was all in her tweet. And that woman, whoever she was, who was on the show, you didn't watch because you were having more fun than I was Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> no. I was probably just wheezing. You know? <laughs> um. But there is a problem coming on that progressive left that I think I don't have any patience for anything that's not. Oh, yeah. Look, I mean, uh, absolutely. There's um, 
I don't think they're done with him on the crime bill and all that stuff. They hate and him. I think, and I think anything, um, I think anytime he says like Republicans, you know, they'll go back to being normal once Trump is gone. Seems naive. Seems naive to me. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of. Um, well, you know what it is? It's Democrats shooting themselves in the foot again. Yeah. And by the way, he's not talking about the 50s or the 90s. He's talking about like, uh, you know, 28 months ago <laughs> when he was vice president and Obama was president. You know, it's not like he's it's not like he's being nostalgic for some crazy. I don't, bygone era. Being, I don't think he's being nostalgic. And I think one of the reasons I'm bringing this up also is because the fact that he pivoted versus flip flopped on the on the Hyde Amendment is he takes it in and he says, all right. You know, we're all in this together. Okay, I can see where you're coming from. Yeah, Let's move right. Forward. Exactly. If he was super nostalgic, he would have. Just he would have just said that. he would have stuck with what it is, and so it says a lot about who he is in a bigger picture of it all. Uh, you know, not that I have a dog in the pony show yet, but but I got to be defensive of somebody who I don't think is warrants the kind of um, you know nasty that I think is coming out of the Democratic progressive left. So. Yeah, I, 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 I don't, uh, I don't think, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think Jordan Reed's analysis is generally that good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not because. Well, I like the fact that she just, responded to me. I will give her. No, that. it's nice you responded, I mean, you know, but it wasn't bigger. like you. Yeah, no, you asked a reasonable question. Um, yeah, I don't think that's not the way to think about Biden. No. I mean, it's true there is an element of nostalgia about Biden in the sense I do think he was he was shaped by a different era, but that's not his. That's not going to. I don't think that's what's going to do him in. No, I don't think so either. But I do think a Joy Reid could, or or and that ill can do him in. That's what I'm worried about. So, um, we move on. Right. Uh, yeah. A lot of polls, but the Quinnipiac poll is interesting. Trump Biden face off fifty three forty Biden, woman back Biden sixty to thirty four percent, white voters forty seven to forty six, Trump black voters eighty five to twelve, Hispanics fifty eight to thirty three. Okay, well, that's a problem for a Democrat, that 58 to 33. Yes. You know. Yes. I mean, if after all this, um, you know, deportation and border, and build the wall. Yes. If he's still getting a third of Hispanic votes, that's um, that's something Democrats need to wonder about. Uh, for sure. And uh, I'd be curious to where those Hispanics were, were right. called in what states, sure. you know, uh, so that would play into that as all. Well. Republicans for Trump, 91-6. Dems, 90, for Biden, 96-3. Indies, 58-28. Uh, it also said Trump is at 42, uh, which is one point shy of his highest. Yeah. I'm going to well, talk about Nancy Pelosi in terms of that last, uh, you know, that, that 42 approval. But if you have anything to say about the previous, do it now. No, just uh, remember, he doesn't have to get to 50. He just has to get to like 46. Well, you know, which is how he won last time. So, so he's. Does it not make you wonder after all of this that his numbers are going up? I know why, I think. Well, I. I yeah, I think I understand why. Why do you think? You first. I, I think it's one. I do think the economy is doing well. And um, also, you know, I think that. Dems got so out there on Russia um, that when, you know, Mueller did not – let's leave aside all the bar spin and all that stuff. Um, you know, when the report did not say he was, like, sleeping with Putin, <laughs> you know, as it bad as the report was. But it didn't say he no, wasn't. No, was, I, and, and the report was very bad. I'm not minimizing right. what the report found, but – you know, Rachel Maddow and the Dems had raised the level of hysteria so high that when it wasn't, you know, you know, when there was you know, right. wasn't oh, yeah. um, demonstrable uh, collusion, um, I I think he he picked up some steam. So okay, so I have a different. I'm take. not shocked he's sticking up. I have a different take. Okay. Okay, so my different take is Nancy Pelosi is the problem because she's on camera and she's no. Because I think that what Mueller uh, did was give them, first of all, on the collusion thing, it does not say, and I think Joyce Vance in the hearing the other day, uh, yesterday with um, um, John Dean, made the point very clear. 
that, you know, collusion is not off the table by any imagination. There was intimation. No, I... I right, well, well, let me tell you why. I'm, well, let me take it out where I'm yeah. going to go. You know, it's, it's cool. But um, here's my thought, which is they had, they had the momentum. And I think that all of Nancy's uh, washing any conversation about impeachment with her pretty smile and her fluttering eyes, uh, with her cutesy, you know, I, I, I don't even think about Trump. Uh, you know, he's not even on my radar anymore. I'm done with Trump. Has kind of, uh, Trump has been, I think Trump made some points on Nancy. Uh, and people are like, why are the Dems being so wishy-washy? Maybe there really isn't anything here. Uh, you know, he's walking all over them. Uh, yeah, you could be right. There's, there's something. Oh, I got it. Could be. <laughs> could be. <laughs> no, I, that's more than it could be. I, I think you're right. Yeah. So I, I, I think, I think Nancy is Trump's new BFF. For those who don't know what that is, best fucking friend. In the, sh- in the, in the short term. Well, you know, today she was out there yakking away this morning, saying, you know, I'm done with them, and there are only 33 people in our caucus who want impeachment. Our caucus is not there. That's that's helping Trump right now with those swing voters. Okay, just well, I, I, buy, I, I buy that. You buy that? I okay, buy that. good. Yeah, I'm glad. I yeah, and and uh, I want to see how that plays out. You know, um, I want to see how that plays out. Uh, okay, so they're in Iowa now. First of all, can I ask you? Don't you think it's high time Iowa didn't have so much power? It, it's not. Well, you know, this is always a crazy system, right? I mean, what should be the first? state and you know you want the first state to be pretty small in terms of population so it's not super expensive you don't want to start with new york or florida so you want a small state you want something reasonably representative of course iowa is not new hampshire is not even south carolina is not nevada which is number four gets closer to a really representative first state that's fairly cheap to campaign in I'd be all for throwing it to Nevada. <laughs> yeah, I, I, because I, I just, I just don't think it makes any sense. And what's happened is at this point, I'm, look at when they start putting, you know, um, the editors of the newspapers out there as talking heads. Uh, you know, it's big business in Iowa. That's what it is. Oh yeah, and also, you know, you then have a citizenry that's really sort of like professional focus group for the rest of the country. Exactly. I mean, people really follow it. I mean, there is something to be said for a very civically engaged kind of place. Well, that would happen wherever they did it because you'd, you'd get you'd get you. Those are the people you would get to be coming in on the deal. So um, probably, yeah. So I just want to say that um, no offense to Iowa, I'm sure it's lovely. Uh, I've only you're been, you're done with Iowa. I've, yeah, I've well, you don't want your own state of West Virginia. You don't want West Virginia, right? Well, that's not representative anymore. Right, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, there are others. There are. I like Nevada. It's got cities. Nevada has, it's got, it has East Coast, West Coast, North. It's got emigres. Yeah, it's yeah, got, it's got everybody. Yeah. I think you're right. It's no, crazy. It's yeah. a little crazy. Yeah, just a crazy enough. Um, at, you know, they vote on the strip. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> they and they vote strip. at the hotels. <laughs> so I think that would probably be better choice. That being said, so there they both are. Trump is there. Did you watch his crazy today? In the morning with the, with the presser? Where he's talking to them saying, like, I, I won't tell you what's in the Mexico agreement. He takes out his piece of paper. Yeah, you figure it out. Okay, I have here. <laughs> Honest to God, I swear, I was freaking out from that. And all of a sudden, you know, my old friend Richard Lewis comes to mind, you know, from Arrested The comedian. Yeah, we grew up together. Good old buddies. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. And Richie, I call him Richie because that's how I knew Richie. Um, And Richard, as he is now. Uh, You know, like, uh, what's the word for for Jews who, you know, who are like crazy, you know, like... uh, Meshuggah? Meshuggah... Whatever, uh, they, 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 uh, yeah. Trump. Trump is the 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 the, the waspy version of whatever <laughs> the Jewish trip. You know, the, what what Larry David and, and what are, their characters are not uh, Michigan. They're they're um, you know they're nuts. But anyway, that's all I was thinking is that even Larry David could not have come up with a character as arrested in development as Donald Trump. I have an envelope. See it? You can't see it. I won't let you see it. Now, what are you going to do? I mean, I mean you can't keep track of it all. Right? That's, it's bizarre. He called Biden a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> what adult uses that word? I, I, I mean, what is wrong with this man? And why do people I don't even take know kids him who use that word. seriously? 
I just, I just, I just don't get it. Anyway, some intrepid reporter did get a piece of it, um, you know, and it, I am sure there was a piece of paper in a white letter like that in an envelope that the president had in his pocket. That was the decree or the deal that they signed. <laughs> I mean, oh my God, this was set a set, such a setup and such a game and so stupid, but it's concerning because I said to a friend of mine the other day, that, you know, Trump is going to go, but it's the 38% of Americans who voted him in who are still going to be here, not to insult anybody, but are they going to move forward? Or are they going to see the errors of their ways? What? Well, they don't have to sign a confession. I mean, they just, no, you know. they just have to like let it go. But the, anyway, this was just totally crazy to me. Yeah, and this well. deal with Mexico, which this and now the secret deal that when Mexico is ready to tell yes. us, and Mexico, by the way, has said there is no secret deal. But I don't even think there was a real deal. This thing that they had was actually worked out like what four months ago. Well, that's what the Times is reporting, and Trump uh-huh. is contesting, and. I would tend to believe the times. Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. so. But I don't, you know, I mean. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in theory, threats, you know, might have had a, might have an effect on, you know, moving your, moving the opposition to change their position. You know, I mean, it could have, I mean, it's not impossible it worked, but it doesn't seem to have done anything. The tariff thing. What are they going to do? Send their, their few troops to the border? To do what? First of all, the problem is not Mexico, really, when you think about it. It's really this Central America, you know. Right. So uh, the whole thing, uh, you know, and he's done everything he can to, you know, well, let's pull money out of there so it can get only worse. Uh, I just, um, you know, who, who, what's going on? And then you get reports that he's seeing these bad poll numbers and he's saying, don't talk about them. They're not there. It's a, it's a lie. But my good friend Donnie Deutsch, you know how I love Donnie Deutsch. Oh, I know. Donnie Deutsch said something right before we went to tape. Donnie Deutsch said, ready? I don't trust any of these polls. There's a Trump effect. Because right. in Trump world, people don't tell the truth, including the people who are polled. By the way, just when he said that, my phone rang. And it was Lara Trump inviting me to go to Trump's uh Orlando event where he's going. To oh, meet. nice. You got a robocall? I got a robocall. I love that. Can you believe that? So maybe I'll that. go. Maybe I'll go. You want to come down? Yeah. We'll go together. Oh, my God. That would be amazing. Wouldn't that be I fun? Would... Come down. We'll, go. we'll do it. Oh, my God. I would love that. When's he coming to town? Uh, uh, the 18th, I think. It's a Tuesday. That could be the, you know. Oh, my God. That would be a great visit. I remember when Nixon went. I'm old enough to remember when Nixon went in the middle of Watergate to Disney World. <laughs> That's where he did the famous I am not a crook speech. Is that true? Yeah. Oh, Disney Orlando's World. come a long way, baby, since then. Yeah. Well, yeah. A lot of development. Yeah. Bizarre. <laughs> oh, my God. That anyway, would be. Yeah. I want um, you to know Lara's voice, not so good. Not no, so Nixon, great. Lara. Oh, poor, poor girl. <laughs> Is she the one who's pregnant? Uh, yeah, they have a lot of kids, these Trump yeah. kids. Yeah. They really, they're very prolific. Unbelievable. Just extraordinary. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, that's a story. By the way, Trump uh, is putting resources, he says, into Oregon. So be after seeing these polls, so you know what that tells you. He's not putting sources <laughs> into Oregon. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I thought well, it was amazing. All right, we move on very quickly. I want to get to the House yes. votes to allow committees to enforce subpoenas in court. And that vote was a very aggressive step, all things considered. I yeah. say that, and I'm, here's what I'm going to say next, which is inside sources tell me that Nadler and Pelosi, it's be coming to a head. Mm. She, he, he is incredibly upset with her. And this was maybe a more aggressive move than she wanted him to make. I'm thinking, vote 229 to 191. I don't know who voted um, or who abstained or who wasn't there. But anyway, that, that's a step. That they'll get to go to court. Yeah. Despite the fact that yeah. uh, Barr uh, turned over some of these uh, documents. Yeah. They weren't the right documents, though. Is that correct? They were, they were some redacted, but they weren't the real core that the Dems really need to see. That's um, what I, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought uh, Nadler was a little more optimistic about the documents in one comment I heard, but what do you mean optimistic in the fact that at, before he saw them the, or after? Uh, well, it was before that he thought they were going to be helpful, you know, anyway, I have, 
but yes, the the divisions between Nadler and Pelosi make total sense, and it's getting um, it's getting huge. Yeah, yeah. I think the more Trump, the the more the administration defies subpoenas, the more calls for you know an impeachment inquiry right. are going to grow in the caucus, and uh, yeah, I thought, and the more there's going to be pressure on Pelosi, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure I get her at all. I, I, I still am not sure I get her. I don't get her. I don't see why she's doing this the way that she's doing it because she's. Well, remember, she's really listening to the 40, you know, 40 plus uh, new Democrats who came in. Who came in on that. Seat. So she's protecting herself, not. And not. those people, you know, it's one thing for, you know, AOC to march up and down and say, I want to start impeachment tomorrow, but, you know. Queens is Democratic, and they don't have to worry about holding. Well, she wants seat. to primary Schumer. Okay, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. the, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's thinking about Abigail Spanberger from Richmond, Virginia. Oh, she's God. thinking about Katie Hill from Orange County, and she's thinking about uh, you know all these people uh, who who got the house back, and she knows that they're gonna. It's not easy for them to handle impeachment. So that I think is what's driving her. And probably memories of the nineties, but but more of those members. I think if those members were on board, she'd be on board. Well, they're never going to be on board, never. Well, they may decide that it's uh, that it is politically tenable that these are you know. Well, if they're going to do it, they better change. do it fast. I, I just uh, again, this is the Dems heing and hawing, and I think this is affecting Trump's numbers going up because they're looking weak. And the one thing that people in this country don't like. Eva is weak. That is true. Jimmy Carter would be the first to explain that to everybody. No question. Weak, not good. Weak, not good. And so they need to get off yeah. the weak train. Did you by any chance catch any of those hearings yesterday with uh, John Dean? And I did catch a little. I caught the insane uh, Jim Jordan. I did not get to see it. So how crazy was that? <sighs> Well, Jim Jordan was like, you know, Jim, white. G Y M is how I spell his name now. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, the, uh, the the Ohio State wrestling oh, coach. Um, well, he kept. Uh, I guess at one point, uh, John Dean had tweeted of him at some point that uh, Trump isn't accomplishing anything, and so Jim Jordan spent about a minute talking about all of Trump's great accomplishments because you know he knew who was watching. Mm. who was watching him at that time. So he went on and said, you know, he's talking about the embassy in Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was all this stuff like, aren't you just in this to make money? You know, <laughs> he was really an idiot. And then this, uh, that Matt Gatz, your uh, guy. Don't do it. Oh, oh, I, I, that I, guy, was it? He's not normal. Go look up something. his record in, in with, with, with the law. Yeah, no, I uh, love the mugshot. He's not right. There's something, uh, there's something off about him. And, I, and he's owned hook, line, and sinker by Mr. Trump and, and, and uh, Rick Scott. You know, Trump was tweeting today with Rick Scott. I mean, they own Florida. They want Florida, and Florida it is, and, and they're, they're all in it together. And it's yeah. ugly, and it's a mess. Uh, and we're going to talk about Florida next week because something did happen here, but it didn't fit into where we were today we'll, we'll, we know. okay another time we but, need to uh, pick that up but it was crazy but i do think the, the, I, I saw a, a soundbite from joyce vance and i thought she did a terrific job uh, explaining to the oh, yeah. bozos um what exactly the Mueller report actually did say <laughs> yeah she was good and dean was good and De well he's always good but i i i didn't i had but, him on the show uh, a couple of years ago uh he wrote a book i can't even remember the book it was a something worth going back we we actually wound up being kind of friends after that he's a delicious human being he's straight forward upright kind of guy i gotta tell you have you ever met him right i have talked to him i've interviewed him on the phone i yeah. have not met him yeah he's he's he you know he paid a price and he learned some lessons um you know he he sees a better a, a different picture uh go back and listen to the, the interviews in our archives um so yeah, I'll check them out. Go, yeah, it's it's well worth listening to. Um, I just want to put a heads up to Justin Amash, who left the Freedom Caucus, or the Freedom Caucus left him. Uh, caucus? Did I say caucus? Cauc caucus. The Freedom Caucus. Uh, so uh, so much for um, breaking with the party. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't be a Republican and break with the party or you wind up with nothing. Uh, okay, so before we close, anything that you want to say? Because I want to bring something completely different on into this mix. What? Anything? Um, I'm, I, I, it's probably too big to get into, but I'm intrigued by, maybe we'll come back to it some other time, the, mm-hmm. uh, the Central Park 5 case, Linda Fairstein. Oh, don't um, ask. All of this, it's just, it's kind of, it's kind of fascinating. It's uh, utterly fascinating. I utterly. mean, I, 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 I know her a little bit socially, so I have to put that out there. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm kind of fascinated. Like all these things have been out there for so long, for a long time. So it really took a, a TV movie to galvanize all this. And well, I'm sort of fascinated. Explain what you're talking about, so people understand. Just sure, understand. sure. This is the famous uh, case from the uh, um, uh, late '80s, the Central uh, Park jogger who was um, uh, uh, raped and, and left for dead in Central Park. Uh, five. Uh, young African American uh, boys uh, really uh, were um, uh, convicted uh, uh, of assaulting her and uh, went to prison. And uh, their convictions were overturned after about 12 years when uh, someone came forward and, and claimed to be uh, her rapist. Um, and it's become a cause celeb of, uh, you know, uh, unfair criminal justice system. And these guys were screwed. And and uh, Linda Fairstein was the uh, sex crimes prosecutor in New York City at the time. She was sort of the model for the uh, Law and Order SVU uh, TV show, and she kind of pioneered, um, you know, sex crimes as a separate uh, division in the uh, DA's office. Um, and she was kind of lauded for that by feminists, and she was a very accomplished mystery writer as well, and kind of an A-lister in New York. And so she had this kind of high profile, but this. This movie, uh, she is uh, portrayed as as uh, racist, and uh, she's played, ironically, by Felicity Huffman, mm-hmm. uh, the actress from the College Scandal. And so, um, anyway, everybody's come down on Fairstein, who is maintaining that these guys probably did it anyway, and it's she's lost mess. her pub. She's lost her publisher. She's been kicked off the boards of all kinds of charities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, left the board of Vassar, which is her alma mater, and. Um, I'm kind of more – I'm not surprised this happened. I'm surprised it happened fast. in some ways why it happened now as opposed to a few years ago. Uh, Trump. Why there is – Yeah, Trump. I mean there's no animus at uh, Bloomberg who didn't want to settle with the uh, um, uh, young African-American men, now now grown men, uh, who got $41 million for the city. Bloomberg insisted the police had done nothing wrong and got – and would not settle. De Blasio did want to settle and did. So I think you're right. I think it's the Trump era that makes all the difference. Well, and Trump, uh, you know, was vociferous uh, in, yes. in, uh, against uh, yes. the Yes, he five. was involved in the case, right? right. So, uh, so yeah. anyway, I went anyway, on too long, but that was it, my it's, it's just sad. I mean, her whole career blown up in a, in a, in a single second. It, it's, uh, it's really rather sad, actually. Um, whether, you know, will, will we ever know the truth? Uh, there is that. Um, I I end on Chernobyl. Did you see the miniseries? I have not seen it. Can't wait to see it. Oh my God! All I can tell you is this: that there is even one nuclear reactor anywhere in the world today, goes to show you just how stupid humanity is. One single, one tiny little move in a whole can blow the world to smithereens. It was a warning, and we're still fighting over <laughs> nuclear plants. Bizarre. See it, everybody, but be prepared to be ill when you, when it's over. Scary. I hear you. Yeah. Uh, that'd be it. Okay. Till next time. Take me we'll back and Florida. see. My friend Don Jensen. I will. To I will. Me, watch the table- hawks. No, listen. Yes. Take two tablespoons of, of vitamin C powder and put it in a glass of OJ three times a day. You'll I'm gonna knock do it out. I'm going to do that right now. Love you. All see right. You. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Go better. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Halle Caster Jane Show. The Halle Caster Jane Show is a production of Resec LLC. 
Be sure to tune in to The Hallie Kesser Jane Show at HallieKesserJane.com or listen on your favorite app. New podcasts are posted Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. 